So I'll just take the last part of the prayer of Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity to the Holy Trinity, uh, combined with um, the memorial today uh, of John Saint John Bosco prayer. So combining those prayers um, to enter into this privilege of seeking the truth wholeheartedly. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O consuming fire, spirit of love, come upon me and create in my soul a kind of incarnation of the word, that I may be another humanity for him in which he can renew his whole mystery. And you, O Father, bend lovingly over your poor little creature, cover him with your shadow, seeing in him only the beloved in whom you are well pleased. O my three, my all, my beatitude, infinite solitude, immensity in which I lose myself, I surrender myself to you as your prey. Bear yourself in me, that I may bury myself in you, until I depart to contemplate in your light the abyss of your greatness. And Lord, you call John Bosco to be a teacher and father to the young. Fill us with love like his. May we give ourselves completely to your service and to the salvation of mankind. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For our judgment, what is true, what is false, we have to go back to the anchor of philosophy and metaphysics, as John Paul II says in Fides and Ratio. And, and so this is where we have uh, the the dawning of the uh, scholastic philosophy and theology of Saint Thomas, uh, and we we read that um, there was a, this professor Schulemann, page sixty eight, who was a priest and professor of philosophy in Breslau when when he even goes back to Breslau, and it's interesting he was also a scholar of Buddhism, <laughs> um, and he wrote some books on uh, Buddhism, so doing comparative theology, but he's the one who recommends to Stein the reading of Thomas Aquinas as a new Catholic, and you should, you should read this. And then later, Eric Shavara, the Jesuit, um, who she collaborates with and uh, takes up these translation works. Um, but then, yeah, page uh, 70, Embracing the Whole. Uh, and so she follows St. Teresa, out of obedience to the eternal truth. A, a kind of truth that encompasses all of the finite and particular ones that philosophy would gather up. And we have this great quote of uh, St. Edith who said, my longing for truth was a prayer in itself. And she described eventually her translating work of St. Thomas is um, questionis disputate de veritate, disputed questions on truth, as prayer. She found scholarship itself to be, to be prayer. Of course, she prayed the divine office and went to mass, and, and, and that was the centerpiece, but still even her scholarship, in a way, was, was prayer. On page 72, so phenomenology was not, in the end, the goal but a method to get to the goal, the things themselves. And, uh, and we see that in Edith's personality is very candid and frank, matter of fact, in her life in a Jewish family or autobiography, just how she writes about people and herself. She doesn't, uh, you know, airbrush things, you could say, it's very, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, and um, so I imagine getting to talk with her. Yeah, she would just cut to the chase, get to the point, um, say what she thought, think out loud. Um, so then confirmed February 2nd, a month later after her baptism, on the Feast of the Presentation of Jesus in the Temple. So again, a deep Jewish reference to the Temple, Temple of Solomon, the center of Jewish worship. And uh, so her present, being presented uh, here in, uh, you know, in the Catholic Church. And even at that time, we read that she expressed a desire 
to become a Carmelite nun. Uh, as you're mentioning with, with Father um, Monsignor Breitling, the pastor of the parish in Bergsa Bern, where the uh, Conrad Martius lived, she goes to this parish, she, she starts attending Mass, and she says, I want to be baptized. And as you said, she, the Monsignor said, you can't just do this right away. You have to be prepared. She said, okay, examine me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it's called manifestation and proclamation. These are the two main forms of religious expression. And in fact, we see this across religious traditions. So a proclivity for manifestation is the sense of the sacred. Uh, that uh, of Rudolf Otto, that Mysterium Fascinans, that Tremendum, uh, something like the sacrament, where there's a manifestation of God, there's an epiphany, there's a theophany, there's a coming close of God, um, maybe something more of divine imminence, Emmanuel, God with us, in, in a very reified way within the order of creation. But then we have this whole other side about proclamation that focuses more on text, testimony, interpretation, the prophetic witness, where it's God who speaks through the preacher, but the supremacy of word. Proclamation is more um, Judaism. Manifestation becomes more uh, Christianity, especially Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Protestant Christianity moves more to the proclamation pole of things. Uh, so, David Tracy, the Catholic <clears throat> scholar, also talks about this in his book, The Analogical Imagination. Um, and so, yeah, in any case, and, and Edith is someone that is um, a, uh, as you say, a synthesis, a unification of both worlds. But to hold those together comes with tension. We experience this in ministry, too. When it comes to something like uh, the relationship between adoration and evangelization, contemplation and ethics, and these kind of relationships that seem quite different, two different things, but how they're meant to be held together. Um, it's what Paul Francis has called um, the diastolic and systolic meter of the church. The diastolic is is the is the contemplative is the expansion of the, the heart chambers and the blood comes in and the systolic the blood comes out so the interiority and the exteriority together but across religious traditions we see you know Hinduism for example would be more um, the manifestation side of things and in all the various shrines and the, the manifestations of uh, Brahman. Uh, and Shiva and Vishnu and Krishna and Lakshmi. And, uh, but then Buddhism is a reform movement in Hinduism, similar to how uh, the Protestant Reformation is a reform movement within Catholicism. And you have this movement toward the, the proclamation side of things, um, uh, especially Theravada Buddhism versus Mahayana uh, Buddhism. Um, so, in any case, this is just really things more. Uh, I guess a, a wider perspective on the phenomenology of uh, religious belief and practice, uh, but he just that you know is one who embodies that I think in herself, her whole life, her writings, and, and even the um, retrieval, the hermeneutics of retrieval of Judaism, Judaism I think Catholicism today, in a post-conciliar mm -hmm. church, in a post-Holocaust world, how important this is, why Edith Stein is such an important figure like in terms of Jewish-Christian relations and not forgetting the roots of, of Christianity. You know, adoration, the sacramental life of the church, we gather together liturgically uh, within this liturgical synaxis, and then it's from that point where we come in that we are uh, uh, empowered, ennobled, energized, fueled to go to go out the same way. And even with, within the complementarity of pontificates, of recent pontificates, with uh, John Paul II, Benedict Francis. Why does Pope Francis put the accent where he does in the papal writings? 
because it's complementary to his predecessors. He doesn't have to just repeat what's been said, but now say what else needs to be said here. It fills it out. So it's not meant to be one pitted against another, but the complementarity is what makes this ecclesiological uh, mission happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a beautiful model um, to bear in mind. And uh, as you're saying, Steve, like within the church, sometimes we need the right ratio. And mm -hmm. sometimes we need to think about adding the more centrifugal pieces, mm -hmm. but then come back to the centripetal pieces. And this this back and forth, um, with what I call a dialectic in a sense um, that moves. Um, and, and so I really would love to talk more in a Human and Divine Being chapter two. Uh, what do you make of all this discussion of spiritual being and within this cosmology? I hope you, you find this to be a feast, it's like all of these excerpts from yeah. Stein and from trying to be integrated. That's why I wrote the book because, uh, you know, I wanted to distill the essential points. Yeah, uh, so in chapter one, Saint Edith quotes Thomas Aquinas thinking about the ideas in the mind of God precede okay. their, their temporal creation. Okay, so it was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this, this footnote, page 52 in the book, it's at the very end of chapter two, footnote 77. And this I found so interesting, and I was puzzling over this last minute too, again. Um, so I was drifting off to sleep, <laughs> <laughs> but um, in the in the introduction to finding an internal being, mm -hmm. she writes, "The question may be asked: Why the author, that is Stein herself, why the author in this work has followed the lead of Plato, Augustine, and Ben Scotus, rather than that of Aristotle and Thomas?" Well, wait, I thought for this Thomas did yeah. you know, what is she getting at here? And, and, and so I organized this, this book to say, to position spiritual being at, at the beginning, at the forefront, because reading her theological anthropology and the whole, this is the centerpiece we have to understand, then to understand the relation of matter to spirit, the body to the soul, and, and the human vocation that, that proceeds from that place of interiority to exteriority, to contemplate the forms. That's a very Platonic thing. And at Plato's Academy, there is the inscription above the door, let no man ignorant of geometry enter. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to think about it, to contemplate the form, not just of the circle, square, rectangle, octagon, but tree, human, whale, contemplative, gaze, perception, um, is after. So Plato, Augustine, Duns Scotus. Not that she says not uh, of Aristotle and Thomas and this hylomorphism, but contemplation seeks especially after the morphe rather than the hule, the form rather than, than the matter. But from Catholic contemplation, it's it's not Neoplatonic, uh, Plotinus and the Aeneas and, and, and uh, prescinding from matter. It's a gathering up of the whole, but but what the causality is especially formal and final. And that's something that's not efficient or material. Think about the form. We're getting we'll get into that chapter three in this book. But what she has to say here about spiritual being, this is some of the best def definitions of spiritual being I've ever come across. And that's what I'm starting to write, write this commentary on Edith Stein because I, I was pre-med and undergrad for like a year and a half. And I love natural science. And uh, I ended up getting into music, and so I switched the major to music. My bachelor's degree is actually trumpet performance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm here right now. But, yeah. uh, music building down the plan, but it's just the part. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, Gabriel, blow your horn. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, so, but I, but I have a love for natural science and, and, and um, you know, in the culture, people are led to believe there's this radical dualism between science and faith. Like you have to choose one or the other. And so many young people think that's the deal. You can't hold the two together. But Catholicism, of course, we hold, we hold the two together. And we want to know the truth about biological evolution. We want to know the truth about the biblical narratives, whether it's literal or allegorical. We want to know the truth about all these things and hold them together. So this was another impetus of, of um, reading Stein, delighting in what she had to say, because I, I saw her as uh, a great bridge figure between the empirical world and the philosophical theological one. And so I was writing these uh, right next to the Timken Science Center on the campus of Walsh University. And, and I'd be at meetings with the natural science guys who are atheists, you know, and <laughs> and 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 I, I sent a manuscript, at least of some of this book as I was writing it to a biology professor. And he saw me in the parking lot and he said, I'm not sure our fields can speak to each other. You know, <laughs> and it's like, but I, that's what I was trying to do. Was, I think, I think we can, you know, the laws of thermodynamics, stuff like energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And Einstein's equation that you'll see in this book, E equals MC squared. And how do we square that with divine revelation? How does this all cohere? So he just thought when she talks about spiritual being, these definitions, and, and she's quoting her friend, Conrad Murch, who's here, page 44. Maybe I think it would be a nice place for us just to do a little text elucidation on the Conrad Martius and see how Stein amplified that. Because the question is, what is spirit? In German, we want to know the whatness of it, the quiddity. Mm -hmm. um, what is spiritual being? Because if we can't furnish that in 2024, uh, things religious are a joke to the mainstream culture. But if we can say, you know what spirit is, there's something to think about. But so often, even in catechesis, it's like an empty, so many empty meanings. So it's our job to fill them out theologically. As St. Anselm said, theology is three days querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. And even though we believe at the front end, we give that ascent of faith to access the stuff of divine revelation and fill out our knowledge with supernatural content, it still is rational. It's a rational theology. God's revelation is entirely rational. It makes more sense than any alternative. And this is the confidence we bring to evangelization catechesis. So Edith Stein gives us ample fodder or goes back to the language of gift and more precisely, the intentionality of self-giving, self-donation. And this shows up very prominently again in the works of John Paul II, Theology of the Body, Vatican II, God in a Spes, paragraph, uh, 22, 22 and 24, that the human vocation is to become a sincere gift of self, which is to say the divine nature is this, spirit is this. Spirit involves an intentionality facing the world. So phenomenology gives us helpful concepts through which to describe the essence of personal spiritual being, not just some static geometric form, but a living form. So the top of 44, self-giving proves to be the primordial language of the cosmos, even when spoken from the heart of the rebellious cosmic resistance to such a noble vocation. That's to say, in this time we see in her writing, she takes original sin seriously in the fall very seriously. This is, this is part of the narrative. And it's how we can understand why all this evil in the world, why this corruption, why, you know, the armed robbery a few blocks down last night, you know, why this? Because this world is fallen. But even in the midst of the fallenness, we see 
this divine language inscribed in the order of creation. As St. Bonaventure said, there's two books of revelation, the book of scripture and the book of creation. The sun that we have light right now, fusion, radiant thermal energy, the photons, the waves coming out. And the star is consuming itself in this process, becoming as science as a victim of its vital task that was ordained by God. And for us human beings, the same thing is before us, the same missionary possibility. Give myself up out of service for the other to the point of abandonment. That's the meaning of Christ on the cross. It's the message in, in the flesh. So, so we see in all this, why do we have bodies? Why couldn't we just be like angels, not pure spirits? Sometimes we, we think about the shape of ourselves, our bodies. Dr. Seuss has a, a nice book, the shape, of, the shape of Me and Other Stuff. And at the end, you know, he's going through all these different shapes of things. And he, at the end, he says, I'm so glad I'm in the shape I'm in. Um, Jose Granados, a uh, Spanish Sacramento theologian, has a great book, Introduction to Sacramento Theology. And he ponders some of these things. And, um, and that the human form has the potential to be cruciform. And the, the cruciform is the expression of self gift. You know, it's the Oran's posture at masses. So the body expresses spirit. This quote on 44 from Conan Martius is, is very beautiful. We could just try to unpack this together, this Conan Martius quote. Uh, find out why would Stein be intrigued by this thought? Because Conan Martius is not translated in English, none of her major works. Uh, hopefully someone would <laughs> at some point, but she's a fantastic philosopher in her own right, right alongside Stein. And, and there's a common genus there between them, even though you might disagree sometimes. But but maybe we could read this line by line and just elucidate what's going on here. Okay, on the level of spiritual being, however, a thus substantiated corporeal entity is in turn capable of transcending itself. Okay, so first right there, what do you think Connor and Mark is getting at? Actually, a corporeal entity, a physical bodily entity, has the potential to transcend itself in that intentionality, which would include desire, what Plato calls the erotic movement toward the true, the good, the beautiful, the unity of these transcendentals. Erotic desire, which results in ecstatic existence, ecstasy from stasis to stand, but ecstasy to, to stand out. And even uh, the um, eventually, the exodus of the Jewish people is the foundation. Oh, in ecstasy from where you are, to a place I will show you. Love itself involves this ecstatic movement of one toward the other. John Luc Marion, the current phenomenologist, wrote this beautiful book called The Erotic Phenomenon. And he talks all about the phenomenality of love as eros. Combining agape with this, like Benedict does in Dave's Caritas S, the 2005 encyclical. But this transcending is coming by way of um, the vocation to love. Uh, even nothing is in relation to, to something that is. <laughs> so, but we, we can theorize there's prime matter, and that is what would be totally opposite metaphysically to pure act. Of divine being, being itself. But this, this pure potency to have being from nothing, and God fills it. Dynamics say things proceed to chaos and disintegration, love, entropy, disintegration. It's only when we put work into something that we turn chaos to cosmos. And the idea of 
Um, what are some examples? Um, as Emmanuel Kant says, we can't imagine anything we haven't sensed in one way or another, even if we have a chimera like the flying spaghetti monster or something. Right. Right? I've experienced spaghetti, I've experienced some forms of monster, whatever's right. meant by that, and something flying. So I syn synthesize it all and then I think it. Um, so there's some, an idea. Um, and But subject of spiritual being is the one doing the thinking. The one intending consciously, the one dealing with this world of ideas, as St. Thomas calls it, the agent intellect, this higher faculty of the soul that is working to abstract from matter. Depending on sense perception, in the case of our nature, we have to see things, hear things, perceive things, and then we can abstract the wetness of the thing metaphysically. But we have chapters three, four, and five to talk about what is the soul in relation to the general contours of spiritual being. Even as when we die, the church teaches the soul is separated from the body, the soul undergoes particular judgment, but awaits the reunification with the body, the complete human nature. And that resurrection of the body will happen on the last day and the final judgment. Um, and But there's only two bodies that we know of that the church teaches for sure are already in the beatific realm of heaven, divinity is Jesus, the God-man, of course, and the Blessed Virgin Mary in her glorious assumption, body and soul. In a full sentence, just a fragment, and we transcend. We do what the text says. Um, so if we continue to read, but this kind of being, and I think she's, you know, she's talking about spiritual being in general, but especially the three kinds of personal spiritual being that there are, divine, angelic, human. Mm -hmm. And especially, so this is why theological anthropology is our hermeneutic key to understand everything as human. This is, that's what we are, so as human. So thinking of this corporeal entity capable of transcending itself in a selfless and non-fixed manner. Not a calculated manner, not proportioned manner, unpredictable manner. This is how love loves. If I were to say to my wife, Megan, today I will love you 20% of your 100. <laughs> Even if I were to say today I'll love you 100%, it already implies some more deficiency. But love, for it to be real, loves. Completely without counting the cost, so to speak. Just gives, just loves. This is how God loves us, Romans 5. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So again, to understand spiritual being from a Christian standpoint, we study the life of Christ and we get it. And so we have to work uh, through this. Um, um, this procedure. So, um, purified, freed from the mass of the limited self to give itself freely to others in vital participation. What a huge word. Uh, biblical. Communia. Commun communion. Participation, fellowship, communion. That spiritual being is called to communion. This is the real Catholic ecclesiology. This is how Catholicism is different than Protestantism. This is why Stein didn't like Kierkegaard a whole lot. Because it's not just the heroic individual going it alone. It's not Kierkegaard, it's not Nietzsche for sure, it's not the Ubermensch. It's the radically everybody Pinkers, his book um, Christian Morality, has this really helpful distinction between what he calls freedom of indifference versus freedom for excellence. And so in freedom, there's two primary aspects. There's free will in itself, which mm -hmm. is the capacity and ability to choose. But that's not freedom. Freedom is choosing what is good. And then we live into freedom. Uh, and and so 
his book is really good on this distinction. It is a domestic uh, analysis, ultimately, and a critique of William of Ockham, uh, nominalism. And so free will is, is not the essential point of freedom. It's a condition for the possibility of gift, both to give and receive. But freedom happens when the gift circulates at work. I give up the prerogative of self-determination and allow myself to be determined by the one who made me. I collaborate with the divine will, but as St. John Vianney said, doing the will of God is letting the will of God be done in you, giving God something to do. I was just revisiting Teresa Babla's foundations. And when she's trying to make these different foundations in uh, Toledo, I think it was, she had a really hard time. She ended up staying in the place like a whole year. They weren't, the city wasn't giving her the permit and all this. And it was this poor man, somehow this poor man, someone said, let this poor man secure the house for you for the foundation. This guy, she's okay. And she tells him, okay, what it, and it happens. Like, St. Paul, 1 Corinthians, the Latin, I always read it in Greek, but the Latin rendering said, Deus dot implementing, but God gives the increase. So to understand freedom is not self determined, but itself is received as a gift. Like, I don't know what it is. Isn't that? Rational to say I'm clueless before God. <laughs> Trust yeah. in the logos himself. Yeah. Throughout the world, the animals are eating and humans are eating <laughs> to survive and live well and enjoy a good lunch every day. Plants matter and animal matter, you know, and, and 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 to eat with reverence, therefore, because this one too has become a victim of its vital task to give life. To the rest, St. Paul in Romans chapter 8 talks about all creation groans as in labor of pains awaiting for the revelation of the children of God. And Maximus the Confessor, this notion that all creation will somehow mysteriously participate in the redemptive movement. And, and so it's only by virtue of the incarnation and resurrection, uh, this logos. Uh, to which all the logoi are tethered, that any speck of creation gets the privilege to somehow participate in the end. But at a first level of reflection, it takes faith to believe this because it appears annihilation, even in the case of our own death. I was walking through the Benedictine Seminary up the hill yesterday and I saw a fresh grave, fresh dirt on it. And it just stopped me in my tracks. You know, I don't know who the man is, the monk is. But, you know, to say oracle notice and to say a prayer for him, you know, this interconnectedness. Um, the song of songs is love that is more fierce than shale than the grave, stronger than death. But it's, yeah, it's precisely because of that love and he's back. Mm -hmm as the testimony of this cosmic redemption within me. Um, that's not fair right now. Oh, no, I like, I like the question, and there's a couple of terms standing out to my mind. I think the Dominican Gilles and Marie's work on the Trinity is really helpful. And when we think of in the creed that the Son is eternally begotten, of the Father and in, in theology, the language of perichoresis, the mutual indwelling of the three persons of the Trinity, or the Latin circular incessio, what's going on here. And, and at the same time, from a creaturely standpoint, always anything through the analogy of entities, the analogy of being, we approach God and contemplate the divine being. Uh, but in, in some ways, we could say God is, we think he's free because he decides to do such a thing. But freedom itself is revealed in Christ. Yeah, in, in involved, involving 
an intention, like uh, a decision. But in the case of God, someone might argue God is not free because God could do none other than love. And, and we would say, yes, God didn't have to create anything on the side of God or other than God. But at the same time, by creating this, like God, it's very interesting in Deus Caritas S. Pope Benedict in two places in the first part of this encyclical says in, in Christ in the Paschal Mystery, God turns against himself. God turns against himself. The order of creation to take its place. But it's like God, that hollering at God's help out. Um, and that, as Edith Stein says, love is goodness giving itself away. Uh, there's this Latin expression about uh, bone diffusing wounds. Um, goodness self diffuses by its nature, and, and divinity is the good. And um, it's all, yeah, it's, very, it's a very, it's a great paradox. And so maybe too often we try to approach divine freedom like we would envision the ultimate human freedom, which is often a bit of law. <laughs> Going back to Genesis chapter three, the symbolic eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as John Paul II talks about in very Tati Splendor, it signifies human beings taking unto themselves the prerogative to determine for themselves what is good, what is evil, instead of looking to um, in the love of God, what happened in Jesus Christ, the happy fault of Adam, as you said, in the Easter egg fell back. It's like, almost like God could have done no other because God's unconditional love. And I just love this truth that there's nothing I could do to make God love me more. There's nothing I could do to make God love me less because that would render his love conditional. But it's constant and therefore free responsible and therefore free i don't i don't want to oversimplify it but uh when even in biblical if, even in history church history and uh the Bible, into the freedom itself yeah. precisely through the self forgetfulness the selflessness mm -hmm. of the gift yeah that doesn't um that that gives without condition of it's going to be received or not if i'm going to survive or not is given up that's right. to the point of abandonment. It's the it's the martyr, um, and 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 this this trust that all will be well, because that's the self revelation mm -hmm. of of the gift, beginning there, and then uh, connected to the fullness of divine revelation, and everything keeps lighting up. But even beginning with the simple concept of the meaning of gift which is not locked in an economy of exchange. And, and so, as uh, John Cavadini from the University of Notre Dame has put it in his scholarship on Augustine, um, that um, there's complete disinterestedness. And now we're talking about agape love. So this is Emmanuel Levinas. And the movement of transcendence that begins with a simple experience of enjoyment, jouissance, an ecstatic movement. I enjoy the burger. I enjoy the fellowship. I enjoy the sporting events. I enjoy the walk in the woods, whatever. The enjoyment, jouissance. But then with pleasure and enjoyment, the self comes back down, collapses on itself. So the next one, and this is the futile logic of drugs and pornography and gambling and anything. I chase the stimulus, I chase the stimulus and I get it and I fall and I get it and I fall. But what liberates the self from itself is not, enjoyment is the beginning and enjoyment is fine when ordered, but responsibility for the other is a departure of the self from itself with no returns. And that's transcendence responsibility for the other, we enter into, we could call the freedom of responsibility with a paradox, because often the human concept is 
Freedom means no responsibilities, no children, no bills of self-sufficiency as the essence of freedom. And it's like, no, that's bondage, actually. It's uh, absence of blessing. Um, and, and so that, that relinquishing of the will to possess, the will to manage, the will to measure itself is entering into this this freedom again, treats to have the foundations. The more poverty, the more wealth. Mm -hmm. It's like they experience this when someone donates, and a benefactor comes around, they're like, darn, actually, because we were in, enjoying this freedom in poverty. We are thankful for the benefactor at the end for the common good and, and the balance of it. But, but it's like, what the experience of poverty, of what seems to be deficiency of lack, actually is the conditional possibility for divine work, giving God something to do in the situation. Like when you cry out, like, "Oh my goodness!" Like I'm, I'm in a, backed into a corner here. What's gonna wait for the miracle? And it comes. But just to draw your attention, uh, especially to um, pages 45 and 46, oh. where we get a real concentrated definition of spiritual being. Um, page 46, spiritual being is that which remains within itself while going out of itself. So this, this phenomenality of being that, that paradox um and, and and it's why we need not just the natural but the supernatural like you guys were talking about um and the natural order will, alone we could end up with a kind of annihilation and loss of the being that's there and gone uh and even within uh the transfer of mass energy we could say well there's there's not anything lost it's just um Change. Yeah, changed, transmuted into this other one. Um, but what about the individuality of that, the being? Um, and yeah, what is this uniqueness of personal spiritual being as distinct from? And that's where the, the concentric circles about the hierarchy of being on page 39, I think are, are helpful to... Um, differentiate some about this too that shows that angels must be real even rationally because they're a category unto themselves and it wouldn't make sense to say we have this gap in the metaphysical hierarchy of being and so um this this philosophy um and then theology we move into revelation of course but the, the, there would be, at least phenomenologically speaking, we could start with the possibility of an angel. But moreover, metaphysically speaking, we find the necessity of an angel, uh, a hierarchical exigency among the categories of being, you know, this language. But this kind of being um, seems to be a necessary uh, mediator between that infinite spiritual being that is uh, exclusive to divinity, which really shouldn't even be in the, in the, in the graph. When Father Stephen brought up the question last time about this, and, and they said, this is unfair to put God as just another layer of yeah, the sentient soul of animals and the properties, you know, defined with each, and then which this book talks about in places. And then we have rational, souls um the boethian definition of the human person as a um individual substance of a rational nature um so i think this is helpful to come back to and see what's peculiar about personal spiritual being divine angelic human in relation to the rest of the creative order of being that, that doesn't exhibit the same way of, of spiritual being again back to page 46 then um this going out of itself that pertains to the spiritual essentially 
you know, the, the operation of the agent intellect, how we think is the operation of spirit. Even for Husserl and phenomenology, while well, they don't you know, get into this taxonomy of things um, supernatural, but it's still, it's still this phenomenon of consciousness that can't be reduced to the interplay of atoms, can't be reduced to neurobiology, neurochemistry, the, the brain is a medium through which the soul takes in the world and then intends meaningful action in the world. Um, and so being spirit, in terms of personal spiritual being, it's um, indicative of its being completely selfless, as we've said, not indeed in the sense of having no self, but a total self-surrender without any loss of self, a self-giving, in which the spiritual reveals itself completely. And that's, that's an important term for spirit. There's something to reveal in terms of meaning and signification, in terms of objective spiritual being, ideas, identity, intentions. Uh, this complete, that conception, mm -hmm. uh, the integrity of the being is given and established. Uh, and and, and because our being is in a state of becoming, and she says that as a man or woman to open this section, and we have all these impotentia properties. And so human nature, once, once conceived, is, um, is dynamic, but we, ontologically it's defined and it's in a sense complete. Um, but over the course of time, we have that movement of the actualization of all these potencies in the person. So what can happen is perhaps a, a vocational um, deprivation in as, in as much as certain potencies are left unactualized yeah. or a forfeiture of previously actualized potencies um, that we have a, a kind of de-evolution de or degeneration of, of the person um, but never losing the ontological status, never losing the dignity of the person in itself, in him or herself. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's an important distinction to make because in Catholic theology, we don't believe in the doctrine of total depravity, for one thing, which is a more Protestant concept. We believe in the perfectibility of the nature by grace. And that potency is always there as long as the person is alive. Uh, so the ontological dignity remains mm -hmm. the same once established. The process makes space for the other to take his or her place. Uh, as Blaise Pascal says, my place under the sun. So the whole usurpation of the world begins with that claim, my place under the sun. And then it's 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 like that thing, not making room for the other. Me, you know, me versus the other, my self-assertion in competition with that of the other or with creation. And then the Augustinian libido dominandi said in the lust for domination, and I'm going to um, exploit, I'm going to control and uh, take up space. The insatiable avarice, which is not ultimately the erotic phenomenon, but self-destructive. Um, so in the case of God, I was reading St. Thomas the other day um, about divine presence, the omnipresence of God. And the divine presence is such that there's nowhere where it's absent. But God is able to be present without pushing the other out. That's divine hospitality. Mm -hmm. So that's divinity first. And when we talk about the feminine genius, what defines that? What differentiates femininity from masculinity? Beginning with simple observations of the body. The body. And so these are plain to see. Uh, these are plain to study the physiology, the anatomy of the body also signifies vocation. 
the way of being in the world. We can't, according to that principle of totality I mentioned last time, we can't be in the world without reference to the givenness of the body and the ontological, the dominance, ones that comes to the fore and then is expressed in the gestation of the body, the gradual growth and development. But, but again, the key with the, the thinking is we, we, we have to renounce the near occasion of reductionism. And so I say we might begin with observing the characteristics of the body, not just on the surface, but the whole integrated anatomy physiology of woman and then that of man side by side in comparison. And why do we have this language? Not because of nominalism, because that's just what we want to say and we can rename it what we want, but because there's the prior givenness of the things themselves, phenomenologically speaking. And in terms of metaphysics, the complete constitution of the being and the unity of the nature, body, soul, that we can't separate and segregate. You know, death does this for a time. It's a stable signification. This is what Bruce Rowe was after, the things in themselves, the universal essences of you know, meaning. So there's a stable a stability of masculinity and all the uh, nearby concepts, male, man, masculine, husband, father, boy. This is one, one thing. Then a female, woman, girl, mother, wife. Six stable significations. Just as there is a stability of the organism, in the in the in the manifestation of its anatomy and physiology, and there's a givenness there. <clears throat> so, going back to the concept of vocation as call and response, to be thrown into existence, as Heidegger might say, we have to respond to what we are to become who we are. We're responding to that. We we don't. Determine it from the start. Some, the intellect is unfolding involuntarily. And, and, and so we wouldn't want to. Voluntarism is bad philosophy. The Willen uh, Zumacht is bad philosophy. Nietzsche's will to power. As if that, that is the ultimate expression of freedom. But we're saying, no, it's not. From a Catholic standpoint, the ultimate expression of freedom involves an obedience to what God gives. And, and, and that, again, the integrity of the person, body, soul. And, we, and so as human beings, again, if someone understands freedom as the, you know, the will to do what I want is the essence. And there's movements that have slogans like pro-choice, for example, is, is an incorrect understanding of freedom. Freedom is inherently relational for us human beings. It's not autonomous. It's not radically independent. This is the magisterium to tell give guidance. We also the recent uh, dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. These are very important things that are being said and Pope Francis is saying because it puts pastoral sensitivity up front without uh, you know, neglecting truth in the end, but that's part of the truth, is to validate the true experiences of the other and the givenness of these two. However, we need, that's where we need the metaphysics, the thought to be anchored in metaphysics still at the same time, and to come back to what is the fullness of truth for us. What is the fullness of truth in relation to God? Mm -hmm. What is the fullness of truth when it comes to my experiential struggles of my sexual identity or attraction? You know, and, and to just wrestle with it. Wrestle with it. As the Catechism talks about, the people that experience same-sex attraction are called like people who experience heterosexual attraction to chastity, self-mastery, is primary and the humility to receive what God has made 
what God has done and uh, how God gives and discerning the divine will in it all. So what to call someone in, in different contexts? Yeah, you know, okay, so the, the dicastery, there are the two documents. Um, one is talking, and the, the language in the uh, Italian is transsexual. Mm -hmm. um, can transsexual person be a witness at a wedding? Yes. Can it be a witness at baptism? Yes. Um, that, that desire for blessing. And how this can be done very carefully and, and pastorally. But we see the distinction still made there that the church isn't saying anything goes, embrace everything as is. But it's that classic saying that God loves us right where we're at, but too much to leave us there. And so for all of us is a call to ongoing conversion to the truth. And oftentimes in our fallen nature, yet not totally corrupt nature, but in our fallen nature, there's there's a lot to overcome to embrace that truth. To seek after truth itself is a struggle, is a contest that uh, like they're called emotions because they're in motion. Mm -hmm. They come in, they go out. They change, they fluctuate. And, and, and there's something valid about the phenomenality of what's going on. But at the same time, um, to make a definitive judgment demands more than the, the emotion itself, even if it's a, it's a pointer. Yeah. But there needs to be a greater inter integration, as you said, an emotional formation, all the magisterial teachings of the church, as best possible in a given historical cultural situation. This is what we look to for the light. And as St. Ignatius Loyola says, if I think it's it's black and the church says it is white, then I it's white. If I think it's white and the church says it's black, it's black. And that kind of trust, mm -hmm. that's what's at stake here. And so pastoral ministry is really messy because of the discrepancy between the is and the ought mm -hmm. within culture. Uh, and and it has to be navigated carefully. And oftentimes, as Pope Francis is saying. In a, in a lot of um, you know sui generis contexts, like we want that blanket rule for every situation, but because human experiences are so many and varied, sometimes the pastoral response it has it has to take time to observe who's involved here you know, in the funeral, the family, and and what what are they going through, and and, and to do something. There's a difference between doctrine and discipline in the church. The doctrines, you know, they don't, they're not subject to um, sempere from one per se, like the disciplines in the same way, the pastoral responses in the same way, which are in reference to the doctrines. Um, but as Pope Francis said, doctrines aren't stones to throw at people. And the, as Pope Paul VI said, the church exists to evangelize. Mm -hmm. So when I see what's happening with, the, with these dicastry statements that are very puzzling to some people, like my first response is trust. Like trust, teaching on church, trust that there's a wisdom. I may not be there yet. I need to catch up somehow. And, and to do that, I need to study what's being said in its context. In, a, in, in all the magisterial teachings of the church, it doesn't change what's already been published and is definitively said. Um, so, like, we can't read a Morris Lentice without familiaris consortio. The, the authentication of divine revelation in and through uh, the magisterial authority of the church, um, that's where we have the movement from generic philosophical God concept as a what and the of whatness to who is this God and how is this God revealed himself, herself, directly. Elizabeth Johnson, she who is, okay. Um, you know, God is pure spirit. How is God revealed God's self as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into the incarnation? And so the authenticity of the human interpretation depends <coughs> on the authentication of divine revelation through authority of the magisterium of the church. Psychosomatic existence as incomplete. And that gets at this uh, necessary accident or you know, central accident that um, there's a complementarity 
that is the language of, of accident, that is the fullness of humanity, without which there's something missing. My, as I experience my humanity as man, it's in reference to another that is woman in general. And without her, I'm lost. I'm incomplete. Uh, the same for woman. Without man, there's this this groping, this lacking uh, for that completion. In the economy of salvation, it's decisively on display in Mary and Jesus. So the femininity of Mary is a sine qua non for salvation to enter into the world. And that's, a, that's and this is why authors talk about the eternal feminine. We have reference in this. Uh, and um, the eternal woman. In the Imago Dei, even we have this privileged language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Femininity is on par with masculinity in terms of realizing this Imago Dei. Uh, because both are required for its realization as male and female. So there's femininity in God. In the same degree as masculinity. But what's revealed in the economy of salvation is a peculiar ordering of the masculinity in relation to the femininity to put forward the metaphorical, symbolic, liturgical um theodrama as Balthasar called it. Theodrama of salvation depends on sexual differentiation and unity in its articulation. I know we're running out of time, but could you just explain why? I don't so the sacrament of marriage teaches everyone, married or not married. How salvation works through becoming one flesh precisely because they're sexually different. That difference itself is again a condition of possibility for a genuine or authentic unity. Um, and and so the, the liturgy is is full of nuptial symbolism, the bridegroom and the bride, so that the man, you know, acts in persona Christi, and in the masculine form that is stable, is universal, and signifies something with reference to the feminine form. So we as men understand what it is to be a member of the mystical body of Christ that is called the bride because we pay attention to woman and the feminine genius of this receptivity to gift that is full of endopathy and empathy and, and this way of welcoming the other within the same is peculiar to a woman, to the very meaning of femininity. Likewise, woman depends on the masculine genius of initiation of gift as expressed in and through the signification of the, ma the masculine body soul. Uh, that is why God becomes incarnate as man, not because the male is better than female or anything like this. He becomes man through woman. Mm -hmm. There's an interdependence to the highest degree of both. And the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary is to say that the perfection of divine gift had to be met with the perfection of creaturely receptivity to gift that will be expressed through woman. Mm -hmm. And so, the back to what Sal said about studying studying divine revelation to understand the authentic way of being in the world is key for us human beings. Otherwise, of course, we're all over the place. <laughs>